Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Hari Krishnan, PhD student working under the guidance of uh, Professor Nitin Nagaraj, who's an associate professor in NIAS. So uh, first of all, at our outset, let me express my gratitude and thankfulness to uh, Dr. Naveen and organizers of Art Park. And my thanks also to Anand Ganesh for uh, also suggesting my name. So this is a great opportunity for me and it's a very learning, a great learning experience. So today we are going to you know, study about neuro chaos learning. So let me first share my screen. Yeah, yeah. today's topic is neuro chaos learning. So uh, there are two parts for today's session. First is what is neuro chaos learning, the motivation behind coming up with neuro chaos learning. The second part deals with the working of neuro chaos learning and how important noise is in the working of neuro chaos learning. So uh, let's get started. So uh, we all know the, 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 power food, the power of AI in today's world, right? So starting from chess playing machine, speech recognition system, GPS navigation, virtual assistants like Siri, Alexa, machine translation, facial recognition, self-driving car, medical diagnosis, industrial robotics, so, so many applications. But if you look at these topics, right, these are different topics, but there's a common theme that unifies all of them. And that is the field of AI. And if you look at the field of AI, we need a definition, right? So there is no universally accepted unique definition for AI. But one definition which uh, I like most is that most is the defining AI as an anarchy of methods. So this was in the, in the, in the following paper. Uh, let me just highlight that paper here. Mm. Yeah, an anarchy of methods, current trends in how uh, intelligence is abstracted in AI. So when I say anarchy of method, what it means is that the methods in AI right, can be divided into mainly three categories. One is logical, second is statistics, and third is biology. The logical is like coming up with uh, no, uh, statements to prove or deduce some uh, logical statements. So maybe the symbolic AI that, be that began in 1950s were more into logical systems, logical AI. So, but what happened is like these systems fail when you know, when unknown when when we when dealing with unknown situations when new data or new 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 statements come they, they kind of fail. So people then move to statistics based learning, which is nothing but the machine learning, which, which is based on statistical learning, basically learning from data and building model based on data. But then or then people slowly migrated to emulate the working of a brain. So what so to to really be to really have an intelligent machine, we need to know how the brain works. We need to in incorporate uh, the, the kind of learning, the kind of learning that is happening in the brain. So then for the past 10 years, there have been tremendous applications in this field, especially the third area, biology, biology driven learning. So here, but in this talk, we are we are talking, we are mostly in the regime of the biology driven learning. So so let's let's try and understand why uh, we are interested in biology driven learning, or the, bi the brain, the ultimate machine. The first and foremost thing is the complexity. Because the brain has a, in terms of complexity and adapting to changing environment, the, uh, the brain is highly complex. The second thing is like, uh, there are the high amount of neural noise and interference. So I, I, at this point, I would like to give, give some numbers regarding the noise, the presence of internal uh, neural, neural noise that is there in the brain. For example, uh, the paper here, right? Uh, you can see I'm, I'm highlighting that the measuring the signal to noise ratio of a neuron. I'm going to give some numbers. So SNR is minus 10 dB to uh, minus 3 dB for guinea pig auditory cortex neurons, minus 18 dB to minus 7 dB for rat thalamic neurons, minus 20 dB to minus 14 dB for monkey hippocampal neurons, and minus 20 dB to minus, minus 29 dB to minus 20 dB for human subthalamic neurons. So what does this mean? This means that the neurons in the brain are highly noisy. And in that high amount of noise, still we are able to learn. We are able to make sense of what is there in the world. So it's highly adaptable. And then uh, there is something called neural signal multiplexing. Basically, the idea is in a, in a single channel, multiple signals are being passed together and processed. So uh, yeah, you can see synapse as a, as a single channel, and there are multiple signals that is being passed through it, multiplexing. And the, the neural computation, the, the, the power consumption is only around nearly 12.6 watts. And these are all unique, right? Unique for the human brain. And when you compare it to the, the current learning algorithms, none of these things are actually true. We don't satisfy any of these things, to be, to be brut brutally honest. So let us, let us try and see why it is important to um, you know, get inspiration from neuroscience. So the, there, are two, there are two main arguments that this paper suggests. One is the inspiration. 
So because neuroscience enables you to come up with new learning algorithms. So the rich source of inspiration for new types of algorithms and architectures, independent and complementary to the mathematical and logic-based methods. The second is validation. See, something which is there, some, something which is validate, something which is there in the brain, that which, which, which we know that is an integral part of learning, then we can we, then, then, we, then it is a validation that such an algorithm, if you are trying to make, is, is, a, is must be an integral part of learning. So neuroscience can provide a validation of AI techniques that already exist. So now. This motivates us to reinvestigate the current learning algorithms. So, uh, if, you, if you if you if you look at the uh, if you if you read this book by Velenu Ramachandran, uh, the Phantoms in the Brain, Velenu Ramachandran makes an interesting statement: Brain science is still in the Faraday stage. So, by this, what he tries to mean is that our current understanding of the brain is very very limited, and there's a long way to go. So, with this current understanding, it has been estimated that there are nearly 86 billion neurons in the brain. And these neurons are interconnected to each other to form a complex network of neurons. And they are inherently nonlinear and found to exhibit chaos. But if you look at the current DL architectures, right? None of these things are, uh, many of these things are not satisfied. So I can say that the current AI is only loosely inspired from the brain. So now we can see the research gaps in the current ANNs and biological neural networks. So uh, ANNs, today's ANNs are actually, um, no, the neurons are actually uh, a linear operation, not linear, to be precise, an affine operation followed by nonlinear activation. Uh, but biological neurons, on, on the other hand, if you see the biological neurons, they are inherently nonlinear. Current deep learning architecture does not exhibit chaotic behavior at the level of neuron for classification. Whereas, uh, the, whereas uh, in, in the case of biological neural networks, chaos is a fundamental Pro uh, property which is exhibited at the level of a neuron and, and, and also at different spatial temporal scales. And the, the current learning algorithm is not robust noise. As we have seen in biological uh, uh, earlier, there are tremendous amount of noise, but still we are able to make sense of what we, what we perceive, what we see in the world. Then uh, the, learning, the current ANNs require a huge amount of data for training and biological neural networks learn from limited training samples. So, so this motivates us to develop something called a chaos theory inspired learning algorithms. So uh, chaos pretty much uh, chaos pretty much fills this gap between AI and neuroscience. And, and now let us have a very, in one slide, let, let, us, let me try to summarize what is chaos. So commonly people have a wrong notion. People see chaos as random, but chaos is not random. Chaos is deterministic, but at the same time it is unpredictable. So let us try and understand why, why there is a determinism. At the same time, there is unpredictability. Let us take this, this uh, equation that you see here, which is logistic map. Xn is equal to 4xn minus 1 into 1 minus xn minus 1. What does this mean is that the current state is equal to 4 times the previous state multiplied by 1 minus the previous state. So now, um, yeah, now let, let, let's so now this is a, this is a dynamical system. It's a discrete time deterministic dynamical system. So why does it deterministic dynamical, dynamical system? Because there is no element of stochasticity in this. Everything is determined. If you know x0, then I can always find x1. If I know x1, I can always find x2. If I know x2, I can always find x3. So together, this, this sequence, right, x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, is called orbit, or the trajectory, starting tra trajectory of this, of, of, this, uh, of this system. So now let me explain the first First, uh, no, first point I have written here, deterministic yet unpredictable. So here you can see this black trajectory and red trajectory, right? And you, you can see that the initial condition for the same system, like xn is equal to 4xn minus 1 times 1 minus xn minus 1, the initial condition are 0.9 and 0 0.9001. There's only a very minor difference in the initial condition. But as time passes, their trajectory deviates. So this is why I call it unpredictable, because if, you, if you're slightly unaware, there's a slight uncertainty in the initial condition, then the predictability loses. So the long-term predictability be becomes impossible. So, uh, so th there's, a famous, uh, there's a famous problem called uh, three-body problem, where people were trying to uh, uh, find the trajectory of Earth, uh, Moon, and Sun. The three-body problem, it turns out that Henry Poincaré uh, showed that the, the problem is unsolvable because of chaotic dynamics, because of sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So the next, next point is like, a chaotic system is bounded. It's nonlinear and it is iterative. And third point, it looks or feels like random, but it has a 
it's a, it has risk structure and order. It is not random. It looks or this graph, this trajectory that you see here, right? It seems like random, but it is, but it, it is deterministic. It has risk structures and order to it. By by that, what I mean is that it can have different periods. It can have period one orbit, period two orbit, period three orbit. So that means if you give me, if you say, give me a period hundred, give me a period hundred, then I will find an initial condition that will give me period 100. So it has infinitely number of periodic orbits, uncountably infinite number of non-periodic orbits, very sensitive to initial condition. And the last property is topological transitivity. So basically topological transitivity formally, we can see that a, a, a dynamical system, right? Uh, satisfies, is, is said to be topologically transitive if uh, for points X comma Y, element of dynamical system, and for an epsilon greater than zero, there exists a point set which on finite number of iteration reaches the epsilon neighborhood of x and y. Basically, right, there are two points, which is two points, two, two points in this dynamical system, x and y. And if you give me two points in the dynamical system, x and y, I can always find a set which from which, which, which on iteration, from, if I iterate from a set, which on finite number of iteration, I can reach the epsilon neighborhood of x and y. So in a nutshell, uh, I'm just trying to cover chaos. But uh, all of these things have, uh, there's a theorem and proof. So we, can, we had to actually prove many things, but I'm not going to do at this point of time. A, a course in chaos theory will, will, will be sufficient for that. So now, now, so what does that mean? So chaos allows for rich uh, diversity, you no know, rich complex behavior. And, and that is one of the reasons why, you no, know, we say that uh, a healthy heart is chaotic. Because why it is chaotic? Because, because of the rich dynamics or rich variability it can have. So if it is rich, if it can, if it can exhibit this rich variability, that means it can cope up with the changing environment. So I will just read out what is written in this figure three. This is from the paper, is a normal heartbeat chaotic or homeostatic? It's a very interesting paper. So here, here you can see heartbeat di dynamics, the normal sinus rhythm in healthy subjects, that is, that is shown here, the left one, uh, shows complex variability with, broad, uh, with a broad spectrum and, with, and a face place uh, face space spot uh, consistent with strange attractor. So here you can see the first column, right? This is uh, the, uh, the, the, the heart rate of a healthy individual. You can see that the, the, the spectrum, right? The frequency spectrum is broad. And at the same time here, you can see the face space reconstruction, reconstruction face space plot. And it, it turns out to be you no know, chaotic. It, it turns out to be a strange attractor. Now, when there is a heart disease, right? Then you can see that there is a, there is a, the variability reduces and there is a more periodic fashion. So there's a more periodic fashion and that is reflected in the spectrum, the frequency spectrum. You can see a, a peak here, peak around, uh, let's say, I don't, I'm not able to see the exact value. There's a peak here. And also the, you can see that the variable reduces in the, in the, in the phase space plot. And as, as, so what it means is that, so if, if there's a heart disease, right, the degree of chaos reduces. So that is what this paper tried to, try, tries, to, tries to highlight. A healthy heart is chaotic. And if the, chaos, the degree of chaos is losing, that means the variability is reducing and there is some, uh, like there is some heart condition like which has to be seriously investigated. So, and, and similarly, so the, uh, the chaos is fundamental to the brain. Like these are two important papers which, which, experiment, which gives experimental evidence of the chaos in the brain. So chaos is found at the level of neuron at the, at, and at different spatiotemporal scales. Uh, so in spite from this, we have come up with something called neuro chaos learning. Inspired from the chaos in the brain and the chaotic firing of neurons in the brain, we have come up with an uh, learning archi uh, architecture uh, algorithm called neuro chaos learning. And neuro chaos learning predominantly has two architectures. One is called chaos net, other is called chaos flex plus ML. So we will try and understand what exactly chaos net and chaos flex plus ML is in the coming slides. So let us start with, uh, yeah. The, the neuro chaos architecture. So here you can see X1, X2, et cetera, XL. They are the stimulus. By stimulus, what I mean is they are the input data. So it can be a speech signal. It can be an you know, exact image, which is vectorized. It can be, uh, no, it can be, um, it can be any, 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 any one dimensional data that you can pass into uh, the input layer. The, this is the input layer contain a set of, you no, know, uh, neurons, chaotic neurons. So, and they are represented as C1, C2, et cetera, Cn. So in this uh, case, the, the neurons are skew, uh, are skew 10 map. Skew 10 maps are chaotic maps. They come from a, a family of maps called, of called generalized lurid series, which, which are a family of piecewise linear maps, which are chaotic. And uh, so C1, C2 are all chaotic maps. The how, now let us see how the algorithm works. 
the moment c1 encounters x1 the c1 starts firing c1 starts firing so let us let us try and understand let us take c1 along right so the moment so here the red the, the red dotted line right the red red color uh, no uh, point that you see is a stimulus the moment stimulus arrives the chaotic neuron say c1 starts firing with an initial neural activity of 0.34 that means initial condition for the chaotic map is 0.34 it starts firing and it stops firing when it reaches the epsilon neighborhood of the stimulus by reaching the epsilon neighborhood of the stimulus what we mean is that when it recognizes the stimulus now let us see uh, now the question is how do we fix the initial neural activity so yeah so that is the second point next point i am trying to come up with so in this architecture right there are mainly three hyperparameters which has to be tuned and they are initial neural activity which is q that you see here q and there is something called discrimination threshold the green dotted line that you see here right that is a discrimination threshold in this example it is 0.499 and the epsilon right? when i say epsilon epsilon is a decides the stopping criteria so now once i fix q b and epsilon i can extract meaningful information from this chaotic trajectory that you see over here so let us see what are, what what all things i can extract so here so once i fix an epsilon once i fix the initial neural activity once i fix the discrimination threshold then we have a then we can have a fixed trajectory right now the the stopping of the trajectory de depends on how quickly it reaches the neighborhood of the stimulus so once it reaches the neighborhood of the stimulus i have a clean trajectory now from the trajectory i can find out i can uh, extract some features like firing time firing time is nothing but the time taken for the chaotic trajectory to reach the epsilon neighborhood of the stimulus so in this example i'm yeah, sorry to interrupt this yeah. the, the stimulus is uh... why didn't it reach after the first the second peak yeah it depends on the epsilon so the epsilon is epsilon is small that is why epsilon is so small that it is not able to reach during the second second stimulus second uh, iteration second trajectory peak this peak right yeah. yes yeah the epsilon is less so suppose if i have large epsilon uh, then i will reach at uh, at this point at this point itself i will recognize the stimulus that's a very 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 good question and it and that that uh, that question itself has a very important significance in the coming slide i'll i'll mention that so how do you choose epsilon and what is the significance when epsilon is big what is the significance when epsilon is small so it has a very very important thing important 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 key in some sense right actually epsilon you can see as has a noise so we we will come to that point uh, that point in the coming slides but it is a very 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 good and important question so right now yeah let me let me define what is firing time so firing time is a time taken for the chaotic trajectory to reach the epsilon neighborhood of the stimulus then firing rate so firing rate so here you can see right uh, uh, there's a blue green dotted line this is discrimination threshold so now what i am doing is like i can convert this uh, this trajectory into a sequence of zeros and ones called symbolic sequence so i can convert this trajectory into a sequence of zeros and zeros and ones based on whether the trajectory is above the discrimination threshold or below the discrimination threshold if it is above the discrimination threshold i will assign it as one and if it is below the discrimination threshold i will assign it as zeros now i can i can fi find out how many times what is a uh, what is the amount of time the trajectory has crossed the discrimination threshold that rate the amount of time the, the trajectory is above the discrimination threshold is called a firing rate then i can compute the energy of the chaotic trajectory energy uh, and then entropy of the symbolic sequence basically the, the shannon entropy i will find out the shannon so these are the features extracted from the chaotic trajectory and this i will do for each and every stimulus so now there are three as i said earlier there are multiple architectures of neural chaos learning so one is chaos net so chaos net uses a very simplistic you know classification algorithm like classification proof Uh, which is nothing but the cosine similarity so basically I, basically I, let's say i have a binary classification problem i i will find out the, uh, the 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 corresponding firing time firing rate uh, energy and entropy for each stimulus of class 0 and i will find out firing time firing rate energy and entropy for each stimulus of class 2 and then i will average out the the feature average average out the firing time firing rate energy and entropy for class 0 and for class 1 separately then i will get something called mean representation vector 
the mean representation vector is a compressed representation of of uh, class zero and class one in the compressed representation which contains like the chaotic the features extracted from the chaotic trajectory and then given a test data then what i will do is like i will find out firing time firing rate energy entropy and then i will find out the cosine similarity with respect to this mean representation vector so to so the, the maximum the maximum cosine similarity uh, to be the, uh, the uh, yeah the, so i will assign the test data to that class which has maximum cosine similarity then the second architecture is chaos flux chaos flux plus svm so here again the, the, i will extract the features like uh, firing time firing rate energy entropy and then i will pass it to uh, like machine learning classifiers svm classifier in this case with svm is a linear classifier so then then the third is like we can instead of svm i can have any any ml classifier like you can also come up with your own classifiers so basically it is these are hybrid architectures they can be connect the basically combining this chaos flux features and ml so in this in the second and third right you can see chaos flux as a feature engineering feature engineering uh, as feature engineering uh, aspect so these are tested on different data set mnist iris exoplanet intrusion detection spoken digit and sars cov2 so in all these examples we are interested in the low training sample regime so we are training with one training sample per class and tested on the remaining data set for the mnist so you can see the performance of this ttss method is nothing but chaos net only chaos net with only firing rate so i am only using firing rate i have avoided firing time energy entropy with just firing rate you can see that up to around 10 sample chaos flux and uh, chaos flux slightly outperforms the deep learned uh, dl architecture dl architecture the black color is a dl dl architecture uh, but of course in between dl also outperforms uh, chaos flux slightly but after after eight samples uh, yeah after eight samples dl outperforms chaos flux and uh, you can see that other algorithms chaos flux are uh, chaos net right chaos net outperforms other algorithms in this in this case then in the case of an iris data set iris is a three class classification problem of three kinds of iris plants and their chaos flux gives a consistent performance uh, for for training with one sample per class till seven training samples per class and uh, again for kinetic kinetic up data set the standard benchmark intrusion detection data set so and here we have to plan classes nine class classification problem and here also we can see a consistency in the in the performance of chaos net uh, and, and remember chaos net is the most simplistic classifier like it does not have like like svm and all does not have hey, can uh, you go back to the mnist yeah yeah so uh, how should we interpret this you saying there are only uh, uh, the the very first thing right you saying there are uh, you got only 10 digits exactly 10 0 digits 0 to 9 yeah 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 and uh, chaos net was about 50% accurate after that yes and dl also was 50 so dl can do that much like 50% accuracy yeah in the case of mnist it was it was able to do that uh, but not with other other tasks so, so in the case of mnist you can clearly see uh, dl was doing better i didn't think it would be better than a coin toss Ha, ha, ha. like i mean i thought it would be no better than 10% right like which is what you would expect yeah this uh, is what yeah. even i also expect it's for you or is it 10 digits uh, sorry yeah, are we using 10 digits or just two digits from mnist uh, no no so here now when I, the x axis is the number of training samples per class so basically from each class i am taking one sample for training ah uh, correct and, and testing on that 10000 test sample test case total data so test that, that, so this is on some test set that it's not seen before yeah it has not seen before exactly yeah okay i didn't do anything be uh, deep learning will be that good okay yeah yeah it was surprising yeah deep learning but for the, for mnis case deep learning was giving this result actually yeah so this is not like this was trained from scratch right like yeah, this is trained from scratch you there is no transfer no learning or anything no nothing i think just it's a purely trained from scratch no pre trained model nothing still yeah so all of these are trained from scratch Like and how deep was the uh, DL architecture, Hari? Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, I think um, uh, two-layer architecture. So yeah, so seven eighty four input nodes. So the, and the remaining, I think one zero two four. So I need to check that paper out paper one zero two four. I think uh, if I remember correctly. Yeah, maybe that's it, Hari. Like if you take one of those VGG type of architecture, it would not have back propagated that quickly in my mind. Okay, okay, I see, I see. Okay, that's what. That's why I was surprised. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, 
yeah so none of these are pre trained like we are training from the scratch yeah so yeah so here you can see right here in this case dl like uh, like performs very badly like for iris case so yeah, again the details of the architecture yeah i will share the paper with you so yeah uh, our paper and kdd cup also you can see uh, then uh, exoplanet classification again there is a three class classification problem here also we can see a consistent performance in the case of uh, chaos net so now again so now here uh, now we have also done some application in the case for geom classification problem so we have uh, sars classification of sars cov2 and sars cov1 so here what we did was that in order to so what we did was like we took uh, again we took low training sample regime so we report an average F, macro fn score of greater than 0.99 with just one sample of for training so here you can see sars cov2 since there the data set is highly unbalanced we cannot go for accuracy accuracy will give a mis, uh, will uh, misinterpret give a misinformation of the result so we go for macro fn score and we took one training sample per class and then we did 1000 independent random trials of training to make sure that what we are getting is not overfitting so with one training sample per class we were able to get 0.99 greater than 0.99 fn score and uh, then we also did multi class classification problem so so these are all publicly available data set so i will let me just uh, uh, like give you the repository name like 2019 novel coronavirus resource report repository and uh, and so, uh, then for for the for the first case for the first one sars cov2 versus sars cov1 classification for the multi class classification we have uh, got data sets from uh, uh, gen gen bank genome warehouse then uh, gis aid and all zero sars cov2 were from gen bank gen bank sorry sars cov1 for from gen bank so for the large, for the multi class classification problem what we are able to get is like we can see that with uh, with one training sample per class and with 200 random trials of training we can see that chaos fx uh, here we are using chaos fx plus svm you can see here chaos fx plus svm is is able to get an average macro fn score of greater than 0.90 so remember this is not overfitting because we are doing 200 random trials of training and with just six sequence sequences of for training chaos fx plus svm uh, reports algorithm reports an average fn score greater than 0.99 can you than expand on what that means like random uh, single shot training is it like how, yeah so basically you... yeah so basically what i do is like i will randomly take a data point and i have a test i have taken i will take the remaining data points of the test set i will test it then i will again to uh, then then i will, uh, uh, then i have a performance for the test data right correct now now i'll again now what i will do is like i will again take another data data other other another data from the data set or another data and i'll test it on the remaining data set like that 200 times we do that so each each of the time it is independent the training is independent it, uh, yeah it's it's trained from scratch every time yeah, every time so so that uh, so basically so we are trying to cover the uh, the most samples in the data set data, data set basically. is it the same test set or the test is also also varies because it what i'm doing is like yeah yeah uh, what, what i'm doing is like if i take one sample the remaining will be the test set yeah so if, I, if let's say a b c d are there if i take a right b c d will be the test set if i take b right a c d will be the test set yeah are you able to understand what i'm trying to say i got it is it yeah. like i mean some sort of a uh, k fold ah, you can you can see in that way also okay Yeah, yeah, exactly. But so, uh, I had one question as well here, uh, Krishna. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you said each time you are doing a training from scratch, correct? Yes, yes. Okay, and then uh, is there some strategy you use to combine the results of the training, or is it just also uh, like uh, how do you actually eventually use one model? Uh, yeah, for for so, for the actual um, inference. in friends so basically here what i'm uh, here this graph actually represents so okay each time when i train right when i test uh -huh. it I, i get a i get a metric right i get an fn score right okay so yeah those fn score i will average it so basically oh. here i yeah average it and that is that is the result i am presenting here so this is actually uh, there are 200 results uh, like, uh, like since there are 200 training there are 200 fn fn score results for a test data test set and that average result i am presenting here 
yeah but uh, as you said so uh, here i am not coming up with a model i'm just trying to show that uh, the uh, how effective chaos fx plus spm is in a load training sample regime got it so, got it yeah yeah so so yeah so now uh, yeah so basically these kinds of models now the question is where does this, these models are applicable for example during the beginning of an outbreak right we don't have enough samples so if if you don't have enough samples we need to we need, how how can these models can be applied when 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 in the scenarios where there are limited samples so then again some theoretical research so let me let me uh, yeah so in 2019 our again our group has done some work on gls uh, based memory encoding like memory encoding using chaotic neurons and also chaotic neurons can be used to build logic gates like gls neurons can be used to build logic gates then in our own work uh, in the, uh, our own work we have shown that a, a single layer that basically the neuro chaos learning architecture right the architecture itself can satisfy a universal approximation theorem so we have given a proof in our paper i, uh, I will share all these papers with you and now the question is that okay till now we have all, we have used gls neurons but what if can we use biological neurons can we use biological neurons so yes we can use biological neurons so we have also done some experiments using hin marsh ross biological neuron so the, the bottom uh, the differential equation that you see here is corresponding to the hin marsh ross neuron i will come to this model later in the in the coming slides in the detailed explanation of this model i'll come to that in the later slides now the, now the, let's go to the part 2 of the talk so what there's an, initially uh, one professor has asked one important question i i'm sorry uh, i didn't know if you had something along these lines or maybe uh, you didn't you omitted it because of time consideration yeah. so one of the things that would be interesting to find out for me was like how uh, how did you learn this i mean uh, is the back propagation similar like see that's the part oh. that uh, i understand okay. that uh, there is a excitation and you get like some uh, spike sequence and all that but how do you do this back propagation is it similar what i mean is it the way you, uh, the hyper parameters are also something that you said it's tuned so what is it that's learned yeah yeah so very 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 valid and very important question actually i i somehow missed that point good that you remembered me uh, so uh, so now the important point is like we don't have back propagation see in our method there is no back propagation so basically what you are doing right now we are doing cross validation to fix the Uh, uh like hyper parameter hyper parameters so we we also tried to do what we also try to we also try to link the hyper parameters like the initial neural activity and and the discrimination threshold right with the degree of chaos but we couldn't get any connection with the degree of chaos like uh, is there a is there a is there a science way of doing finding out the hyper parameters like kind of degree of chaos with learnability but we couldn't find out any connections but right now so right now what we are doing is like we we do k fold cross validation Uh, in the in the in the training set in the we tra uh, in the training set like eighty twenty we fit and the eighty we do the k fold cross validation we try to vary the epsilon we fix q and b and we vary epsilon like the epsilon is nothing but noise intensity and then find out the best epsilon for which the model works best so right now we don't have any uh, back propagation so far <coughs> but yeah. uh, but okay so as a follow up question uh, yeah. what Navin was asking yeah. so. uh you said you will still vary it uh, without any back propagation you are varying the parameters right yes, yes yes but but there is there is supposed to be some strategy you are using for varying the parameters or like how does it work is it like line search or what do you do for yeah yeah so so the, i will tell you the underlying uh, what is happening underlying uh, underlying pattern like underlying uh, like essence so so basically we are doing a grid search right now but there is also an intuition behind that See, we need we need that Q, B, and epsilon, which have which have different firing time, firing rate, energy entropy for data belongs to distinct classes. Like, for example, it should it should give me different a distinct firing time, firing rate, energy entropy for data belongs to class zero. It should give a distinct firing time, firing rate, energy entropy to data belongs to class one, class two. So so you can say that I am trying to if you, if I take the mean representation vector, right? The distance of mean representation. vectors of class 0 and class 1 should be maximum maximized they should not be similar if it is similar then then both of the class uh, are actually colliding the, the trajectories are similar the firing rate firing time energy entropy are similar so basically you can see that you can even formulate it as an optimization problem like uh, like maximize the mean represent the distance between the mean representation vector subjected to the constraints uh, with respect to 
like q b and epsilon maximize uh, so so and, and force validation in, in in some sense is is actually guaranteeing that thing uh, uh, am i am i if my answer satisfactory like uh, are we able to understand uh, what uh, maybe i mean in the interest of time uh, I, i just had one uh, okay maybe uh, uh, yeah, you, uh, yeah. like a quick uh, <laughs> quick clarification yes, so yes, okay yes. let's take the maximization problem you said right yeah, yeah. so uh, so even there there is some kind of uh like i mean uh, navin was talking about back propagation or like see there is something where you have to measure an error and then based on the error you do a search yes, right yes, that yes. is typically how the uh, uh, optimization process is happening okay. so when you say maximization i mean what do you base the search direction on yeah so here no see uh, so right now i have put what i am doing in an optimization point of view so so here i am using f1 score see i'm using f1 score as a measure to ensure that okay i see okay yeah. okay so there yeah. is no actual error measurement but just the score itself is your parameter to exactly uh, exactly exactly actually and actually i want to say is a valid point because now we can also we see the thing is like we uh, we can in future we can actually find we, uh, solve this problem using optimization the thing is like what optimization algorithm we use that we have to figure out we actually till now we don't have we have not figured out that but right now we are using scores but the same problem can be mapped as an optimization problem so yes okay okay yeah. so yeah now going back to the second part of my talk the role of noise in your chaos learning so this is something very very interesting so uh, so as i told you earlier so we in our method right we have something called initial neural activity discrimination threshold and epsilon so the the major crux of our method depends on epsilon so let us let us try let, let us try and take uh, three scenarios when epsilon is zero when epsilon is um, intermediate epsilon is a value uh, intermediate value of epsilon and epsilon is very high epsilon is close to 1 so we are allowing epsilon to take, have values in the range 0 to 1 uh, 0 to 1 okay so now uh, what if epsilon is zero let us try and understand that scenario if the epsilon that's the first case if the epsilon is zero right the trajectory will never stop the trajectory will keep on continuing by epsilon zero what i am trying to say is that the trajectory should exactly hit upon the stimulus if the let's say the stimulus is point 9 the the trajectory should exactly hit on the stimulus and it is like hitting on a real number which is the probability zero so the trajectory will never end the algorithm will never never stop algorithm will keep on running so zero zero epsilon can be seen as uh, 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 will not actually uh, will make the uh, uh, yeah when the epsilon is zero the algorithm will not work now when the let's say when the epsilon is too high when the epsilon is too high that means that's the third case so epsilon is too high then in 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 one iteration in one or two iteration i i can hit upon the stimulus in one iteration i can hit upon the stimulus so here you can see you know so for intermediate value of epsilon what i am getting for intermediate value of epsilon i what i get is a is a uh, uh, I, i get an intermediate firing time for intermediate value of epsilon i get an intermediate firing firing time so it turns out that for uh, the, the 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 method works best when the value of epsilon is intermediate so here epsilon is nothing but noise intensity so here you can see right the blue color the blue the blue uh, the blue uh, the blue signal that is overlapped with the red dot the red line right that is a signal plus noise the stimulus plus noise so we are basically adding noise to the stimulus noise to the stimulus so when this noise intensity is intermediate we get the peak performance in our method so 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 that and there's a, and that phenomena is called stochastic resonance so we will come to that now let us try and understand let us try and understand two kinds of system one is a linear system for a linear system if you if you add noise to the input the performance of the linear system degrades but for certain non linear system it's important to note there are certain non linear system if you add intermediate amount of noise the performance of the system increases and for an intermediate amount of noise the performance is peak peak so such 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 a phenomena is called stochastic resonance it's called noise enhanced signal processing and uh, stochastic resonance so let me just read out so when stochastic resonance was uh, first used so stochastic resonance was uh, the term sr was first used in the context of noise optimized system by roberto benci in 1980 with regard to a discussion on climate variations and variability so benci introduced sr 
in connection with the explanation of to a periodicity of 10, 10 to the power 5 years found in the power spectrum of paleoclimatic variations for the last 700,000 years. So basically, in order to explain the periodicity of ice ages, this, this concept was first introduced uh, and introduced by Robert Bensey. Later, it, it was the, later this was took forward in electro, electrical circuits. And uh, even, even there was a, so much huge amount of research, SR in, SR in neuronal systems. Neural, neural, neural systems. There are so much of research happened in, uh, along those lines. So let me just simply, uh, on, in a nutshell, let me just let me just try and explain what is stochastic resonance. So, in, so in a nutshell, there should be for SR to happen, there should be an information carrying signal, and there is a noise which is added to the added to the system, which is a nonlinear system, and and there is a performance measure that captures the system's performance on varying noise levels. So, so and, and we observe the, the performance of the system increases when an intermediate amount of noise happens. So, so in, in the diagram here given below, you can see that there's a peak performance when the noise magnitude is intermediate. So this phenomenon is called uh, SR, stochastic resonance. And SR has, has, has been already applied in you know, efficient encoding of auditory information in, for cochlear implants. And there are experimental evidence of SR in crayfish mechanosensory, mechanosensory neurons. So the mechanosensory neurons are highly noisy, and there also um, this uh, this, uh, this empirical evidence of SR has been found. So then behavioral stochastic resonance in paddle fish. So in this experiment, there's a paddle fish, and there is Daphnia, then it's a prey. The paddle fish has some electrosensory uh, like receptors in its beak-like structure. So when an external electrical noise is added. The, detect, the detectability of the prey becomes higher. So this, all these things you can uh, have the, given the references. So, so yeah, SR is something which is uh, very counterintuitive at the same time found to be in the natural systems, in, uh, in certain nonlinear systems. So now let us, let us try and understand how SR is being uh, happening in NL, neurochaos learning. So we, here we cooked up an example, very uh, hypothetical example, where there is an organism the organism has to find its prey and its predator based on the size of the prey and predator. Let's say the organism has a size equal to 0.5. So, uh, yeah, the organism has a size equal to 0.5. So, anything, any other organisms which are less than, which are less than, which are, which are having a size less than 0.5 are prey, and which are having a size greater than 0.5 are predator. So, that is replicated in this, in this picture here. Point, uh, so, less than 0.5 belongs to class 0. And greater than 0.5 belongs to class one. So as I said earlier, we, we have uh, like other uh, initial neural activity fixed to 0.25 and discrimination threshold to 0.96. And we uh, report an average accuracy of 100 percentage for noise in the, for noise intensities ranging from uh, 0.248 to 0.253 in the five-fold cross-validation with 80 instances per each class. Basically, what we did was that we took uh, we, we fixed the initial, initial activity, neural activity, and discrimination threshold to 0.25 and 0.96 respectively. Then we varied the noise intensity. And for each noise intensity, we did a five-fold cross-validation of the training data, training set. Uh, training set. And, 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 the, and the result of the five-fold cross-validation is, is being given in this graph. So we observe that when it is when the noise intensity is between 0.248 and 0.253, we get a maximum F1, uh, sorry, av average accuracy equal to 100%. Which is, which is similar to the peak that you have observed. So let me so let me uh, give a visual representation of the same thing. Uh, uh, I don't know why this visual representation is working, or not working, one second. Let me just uh, present it once again. Yeah, so here you can see that there's a stimulus and I'm adding noise to it. So the, the blue signal is stimulus plus noise. So here you can see in the second graph, there is a the mean firing time of class zero and class one. So I was telling earlier, right? For intermediate value of noise, I can see that uh, there is, I can find an appropriate firing time. Firing time, I can appropriate, I can find an appropriate firing time, which can, which gives me, so you, here you can see, right? Uh, yeah, for intermediate value of noise, I can find like the, the mean firing time of class zero and class one, which gives me, uh, which, which are optimal features, which are optimal features for classification. So optimal noise equal to optimal gives optimal firing time, which gives me best accuracy. So yeah, this is a general architecture. Uh, 
uh, of neural chaos learning they have input and uh, input and a threshold uh, and a threshold uh, yeah input and uh, and i'm adding the adding noise to the input and passing to chaos net and uh, based on three kinds of noise like low noise medium noise high noise uh, i can see that for a medium noise the detectability or the classification is high so so here comes uh, so high, so here this, this architecture i have given an application of nl for signal detection i'll come to that in in a couple of slides but before that i will try to give you some of the application of yeah uh, uh, sorry i had a question yeah. yes yes so if you can go back to the previous slide yeah so in the chaos net sorry yes, uh, the next slide yeah so in the the chaos net uh, so you'll have like many neurons depending on the size of the input right suppose if it's uh, 28 cross 28 you'll have 74 neurons is it like that uh, basically uh, 28 cross 28 right so i have yeah. 28 neurons i am passing each row each row at a time right okay okay you'll have 28, 28. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so all of them will have the same uh, values for epsilon. The Q. Yeah. yeah so right. Epsilon. Right now we have. Right now we have choose uh, same value of epsilon for all the twenty eight. But okay. as you said, we can we can have different values of epsilon. We okay. can we can we can optimize. We can opti we can find different for different features. What is the optimal of epsilon? We can even do that. But only thing okay. is, it requires some computational complexity is a little bit higher in that case. Okay. That's the only reason we didn't go for that. But as you, as you rightly said, we can do that. We can even do that. And okay. even even for each neuron, right? We can have different okay. different initial neural activity, different discrimination mm -hmm. threshold. Even we can have different neurons. Like we don't need GLM. We don't. We don't need. We, we can have logistic map. Like 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 skewed and map, right? We can have logistic map. We can other. We can have other neurons as well. We don't need to restrict with a particular neuron. Okay. So for tuning based on F1 score, uh, which you said earlier, you were uh, like tuning like three parameters, or like is it only epsilon that was? Tuned? Yeah. So so in this work, I have tuned so whatever I have shown right now, right? Yeah. I have tuned only for epsilon, like okay. uh, Q. So, so the, the interesting thing is, right? Uh, see what I for, from my experiments, what I can what I have observed is that no, for different values of Q and B, right? I have I can I have I have received similar performance. But the major thing was epsilon. The epsilon is the thing that may, what have, was giving me uh, the, the major you know, changing uh, change in performance, okay. epsilon. So, uh, so is it uh, correct to say that it was like a one parameter network? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we can say that. Like, uh, given, see, only thing is like, we have to be very careful in choosing Q. I'll tell you why. Suppose, see, as I said earlier, chaos can also give you uh, periodic orbits, non-periodic orbits. Like, if, you're, if, you, if you fix a Q, which is corresponding to a periodic orbit, then, then you can no longer reach the neighborhood, right? So let's say you have a period two orbit, like one two one two one two one two. It will never, it will always be in this pattern. So okay. I have to be careful in that in choosing my Q in that sense. Okay. I should but avoid the, all periodic orbits basically. Okay. So, but the tunable parameter is only one for the whole network. Right? Yeah, yeah. So the main parameter is one. But what I'm saying, but you right now you can see it as only one, but okay. you can even tune other as well. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So I had uh, I had one uh, question, uh, you know, based on the way you just explained. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I'm just wondering, uh, is the problem of uh, the, whatever this chaos orbits that you are talking about, right? Uh -huh. can, can we uh, is it is it okay to view the problem as a search in a, a one dimensional space uh, for reaching the stimulus? So okay. instead of modeling it with a chaotic function, can it mm -hmm. just be a search? Like just a random search in one dimensional space to attain that uh, <clears throat> yeah. that uh, stimulus value. Is that yeah. is that also an acceptable formulation in this? Uh, the problem with that is, see, see, look, let us see, let us try and understand that. So mm -hmm. if I say it is a random search, right? See, think mm -hmm. about the complexity. For example, right? Uh, let us take a vector, a vector of numbers. Okay, vector, which is let's say okay. ten locations, and if I'm allowing random numbers in each of the location, right? Mm -hmm. Think about the all possibilities. See, in the case of chaos, in the case of chaos, right? I just need Q. It is deterministic. I just need one param one parameter, which will generate the entire trajectory. But in the case of a search problem, right? I have to. I have to. First of all, I have to. Uh, like there are infinite number of possibilities, basically. Like, uh, like for example, right. I, I mean, uh, we can we can we can also consider a finite bound also on that, right? Because uh, at the end of it, you are also trying to cap the chaos function in like you said earlier by definition yeah, yeah. you need boundedness in the function yes 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 but and if you if point, you and one more point is there the boundedness and also there's something called topological transitivity see 
uh, I'm able to reach the neighborhood of epsilon, like neighborhood of a stimulus because of this property of chaos. Like, see, uh, topological transitivity in, ensures that, see, it actually means if you give me any value, you give me x, 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 okay, you give me a value called x. I will always mm -hmm. find an initial, I can always find there exists, there exists an initial value x. Uh, said, said, which one finite number of iteration will reach the neighborhood. So chaos actually guarantees that. So, I, I, so for the, in, in the case of randomness, I don't know whether it is guaranteed. That is only a confusion I'm having there. I'm not sure whether that is guaranteed in the case of randomness. Uh, are you able well, to... Yeah, yeah. Finite number of steps is possible, but the, the, the exact number of steps itself might vary. Huh, that will vary. That will vary. <laughs> point epsilon. Yeah, that is true. But the finite number of steps can you can trace back. Uh, like for example, you know there are these uh, in path planning philosophy, right? There is this randomized okay. path planners, randomized where okay. they they are actually called randomized path planners, where you do uh, you are you basically generate a path to okay. uh, let's say a given destination. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way I was looking at this uh, plot was uh, okay. you know so on similar lines, but. Uh, that's why I asked if we can treat this as a random search instead of bounding it to a function, a chaotic function. Can I intervene? Now, this is Nitin here, uh, Mukunda. So the, the, I think the main point is we don't want randomness, you know, because we want to mimic the firing of the brain, you know, the neurons in the brain. And uh, it, it, I mean, that, so it's biologically inspired, you know, if you make it random, then it's no longer mm. biologically inspired. That's the point, you know. You could do it randomly, that's true. Mm. But uh, the point is that we, we want to simulate the, the neuro chaos in the brain, right? So, for example, we have used the hindmarsh rose neurons as well. So, the, the trajectory is also important because the features depend upon ah. the order of the values, right? The feature depends yeah. upon the trajectory. Yeah, actually, that is exactly what I was looking for. So, the trajectory is the key. Exactly, exactly yeah. So, basically, you know, we, are, we are just doing neuroscience on the trajectory. That's all we are doing, you know? Okay, okay. The, the, the whole thing is like, it's like an organism, right? It, it's, just, it's, a, it's an organism with these neurons and it, it has an internal representation of the stimulus and we do we're doing neuroscience on that you know so i don't think randomness would do the job you know i mean um, yeah i mean okay i understood i mean that, that's what i was curious about right. yeah, yeah. so the trajectory is what uh, very very is important yeah trajectory is the one which is actually doing all the job you know okay yeah. <clears throat> basically it's, it's encoding uh, the signature of the stimulus you know of the entire class or entire tra training instance it's okay. an internal representation of the like you're seeing a cat right you're seeing a cat then neurons in your brain are firing with a particular, uh, you know, with the firing rate, with the fire, with a particular interspike interval, with the with the neuronal code. So something mm -hmm. similar is happening here as well. You know, the the it's an internal representation of the outside world. You know. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and that is what is encoded in the trajectory. Exactly, that's what's encoded in this trajectory. So that, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So yeah, here we took. Uh, here we can see the application of chaos net in spoken digit classification task. So we, uh, this is, that is a publicly available data set. And there are 10, uh, 10 classes, like spoken digits corresponding to zero, one, two, three, et cetera, nine. We took the speaker called Jackson and the sampling rate is 8,000 Hertz. We took to, uh, to, um, 2,000 and like each row, each, each, uh, uh, like, yeah, each speech uh, has 2753 samples in it. We did uh, DFT like uh, Fourier pre-processing. We took the uh, Fourier, uh, Fourier transform magnitude spectrum, and then we passed that the normalized Fourier, Fourier spectrum, right? That was that has been passed to the chaos net architecture. So again, we what we did was like we just uh, we just took the bare like the most uh, simplistic chaos neuro chaos learning architecture, which is chaos net, and again we fixed we have uh, q equal to 0.34 and b equal to 0.499. And a noise intensity of for a noise intensity of 0.178, we get a maximum macro average FN score of 0.9111. So here you can see that there is there are there are multiple peak performances. You can see there are multiple SR that has been demonstrated. So we define this some some called local SR and global SR. So and we uh, so we choose that particular noise intensity which corresponding to a global SR. So here for point for noise intensity equal to 0.178, we get a Global SR of uh, global SR and and uh, and a reference score corresponding to it is 0.911. Then we what we did is we, we now applied we we took the chaos effects features and did SVM with a pass to SVM classifier with a linear kernel. So again we can see that uh, for different for Q equal to 0.68 equal to 0.09 and noise intensity ranging from 0. Uh, 0. 0.001 to 1 with a step size of 0. 0.001 for a noise intensity of 0. 0.0265 we obtained an average macro fn score of 
point okay nine nine ah point nine nine one yeah here we can see in five fold cross validation. So this is a cross validation. This is not a tested result. It's a cross validation result I'm presenting to you. But to show that uh, SR is also can be observed when even despite having different classifiers, even you have SVM classifier, you can still see this 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 SR kind of plot. Yeah. So next application we we did was in signal detection. So so now the the, the, the problem is this: you have you have a signal which is sub threshold, and the threshold. So in this case, the the, the first diagram that you see here right one second let me uh, take my pointer the first signal that you see here right first graph so there is a sub threshold signal and there is a threshold you can see say xth the blue dotted lines the signal is below the threshold and it no way it can get detected so now what we have what we can do is like what if we add intermediate amount of noise okay and how does it how does it performs how do, how does how does uh, can we recognize this, uh, recognize the stimulus let the signal so what we did was like we pass we, we pass this this sine wave right a, a sine two pi ft plus one by two to the chaos net architecture with different epsilons and what we did was is we took the firing time and normalized it we took the normalized firing time so we under very low noise intensity we can see that there is a uh, it, it it eventually crosses the threshold but there is a there is a total distortion in the shape of the signal but for a medium amount of noise right we can we it preserves the periodicity it, preser it preserves the pattern basically it preserves the for a medium amount of noise it preserves the pattern so what you see here is the normalized firing time after passing this x of t to the uh, uh, chaos chaos uh, chaos net architecture normalized firing time then uh, then under high noise right under high noise with one in one iteration itself we can we, we will get the stimulus we, we will detect the stimulus so that means in one iteration means like it is too much of noise right so the, the firing time is zero in that sense like in, like basically one fire time is very small like it actually it need not fire because it is already in the neighborhood with very high noise so that is why you can see you can see here uh, no a, a zero so it, it does not detect so basically signal detection is possible in neurochaos learning under medium noise under medium noise so and and this is the cross correlation coefficient versus the noise intensity which captures the uh, which captures a correlation between the between the input and the and the out, output like the normalized firing time so in the case of intermediate amount of noise right you can see the maximum cross correlation coefficient so and the maximum uh, cross correlation coefficient is 0.97 uh, for a noise intensity of 0 0.033 then we have used this hinmarsh's neuronal model so let me just try and give the the, the motivation of from where Hinmarsh-Ross has come. So let me just read out that. So yeah, so Hinmarsh and Ross in their 1984 paper titled "A Model of Neural Bursting Using Three Coupled First Order Differential Equation" has uh, come up with this differential equation. So what they did was that they did voltage clamp experiments on the brain of a pond state, and from the neuronal cell data, they observed a bursting behavior which outlived the stimulus. When depolarized by a short electrical pulse, and and these and they also ex they also uh, sh uh, have these neurons, right? These uh, right? under this experiment, they also found different behaviors ranging from bursting to chaotic regimes. So now, uh, and that Hinmarsh and Ross model it as a three differential equation, and here x of t x of t represents the uh, membrane potential of the neuron, and uh, y of t represents the recovery variable, and z of t represents the adaptation variable. So there are eight parameters in this uh, model. Like you can see A, B, C, D, X1, uh, yeah, and I, R, and S. So A, B, C, D, X1, we fixed to one, three, one, five, and minus one point six respectively. Then we choose I equal to three point two eight. I is the external current, current applied current. Sorry, the applied current. R equal to zero point zero zero two one, and S equal to four, because under these parameters, the Hinmarsh's model exhibits chaotic dynamics, chaotic behavior. Then we took x of t. We took the membrane potential as a trajectory instead of instead of the trajectory of the GLS map. We took the x of t as a trajectory and we took the normalized x of t as a trajectory. And and we still and we we did a toy example. Basically, we did the same example like the prey predator hypothetical prey predator classification. And for this example also, we can see clearly SR has been shown in uh, using uh, yeah NL, when NL is incorporated with Hinmarsh's model. We can still preserve. We can still see 
stochastic reference phenomena. So here we can see for a noise intensity equal to 0.14, we get an average macro reference score equal to one in five fold cross validation. So, uh, so we can also in incorporate other neuronal models which exhibit chaos. So not just limit to Hindman source model. So now I'll come to the conclusion part. So um, yeah, so one main thing in stock is like, we are inspired from the chaotic firing of neurons in the brain. And uh, we cannot avoid chaotic firing, firing of neurons. And that is being used in the current AI. So uh, we talk about continual learning, uh, uh, in, uh, then uh, reinforcement learning, but nobody talks about chaos. How, do, how can we incorporate chaos fundamentally in learning? So we, uh, based on that, we, we get inspiration from, from chaos and then we develop this NL architecture. In the low training sample regime, we were able to show some uh, good performance and uh, uh, state of the art performance. And, and our method does not have any back propagation. We have very few hyperparameters like initial neural acti activities, discrimination threshold, and noise intensity. Then, uh, then in our in the NL, noise and chaos interact to give you know, a phenomena called stochastic resonance. Going forward, we would also like to see that, uh, like in the brain, right? Computations is, is highly noisy and still computations are happening. So we want to, how, how can we incorporate like low SNR computation in, in learning? Then can we, can we use heterogeneous neurons in NL? And one, one, one uh, question that came from the participant is that, can we have different epsilons? So that is also one line of work I'm actually planning to do. Uh, different epsilon for different, different features or, or, or using heterogeneous neurons in NL. And then can we uh, and incorporate then then right now right see we have only used very 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 few properties of chaos like one is the topological transitivity property yeah that, that is the main property that we have used but there are so many other properties like uh, periodic orbits infinite number of periodic orbits non-periodic orbits so can we use those things so we don't know so this is just a beginning i think going forward we would like to more explore more on chaos and try to link it with learning like uh, other applications, we want to try it off neuromorphic computing, I mean, edge applications. Like since it has very few parameters, the, the method will be useful for edge applications. And uh, we also want to um, apply this for few short learning and continual learning. So some of the publications are uh, like uh, are provided here when noise meets chaos in SR in NL, which is published in neural networks and uh, um, ChaosNet, a chaos based artificial neural network for classification published in chaos in the internationally journal of nonlinear science. Then uh, two conference publications, one in SPCOM, uh, uh, other in uh, GCAT. So yeah, so uh, some, some the, the researchers who have cited the, our work, they, they have, so some of the researchers have developed on top of ChaosNet. They have, uh, they have used ChaosNet architecture, like modified it in, uh, for continual learning. And uh, the deep chaos net work, right? Deep chaos net for action recognition in videos. And they claim to have state of the art performance for uh, for 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 the, the, the task, uh, yeah. So all the codes that we for, for for our works are available online. The chaos net is the first version of the code. Uh, so chaos fix it. Um, chaos fix extracts the features like firing time, firing rate, energy entropy. Chaos fix plus SVM uh, like combines with the SVM classifier. Then SR and NL. So I would definitely encourage people to work on it uh, and try uh, try to modify it. Yeah, so now I would like to thank uh, like uh, my advisor, like Dr. Nitin Nagraj, who, who, who has really helped me, uh, like has spent a lot of time discussing. So because of that, this work has come out in this shape. And I would like to thank my collaborators, Dr. Aditi Katpalia, who is also a student of Dr. Nitin Nagraj, and she is doing her postdoc in Czech Republic. And uh, Professor uh, Snehan Chusaha, uh, he is uh, he's an associate professor from in, in Bits Pilani, Goa campus. Then doctor, uh, it's, a, it's a doctor by training, uh, MBBS doctor. Uh, he is yeah, Dr. Pranay S.Y., who is also a collaborator in the genome classification work. I also uh, thank Nias for giving me an opportunity to work here and also the Tata Trust project for taking care of the funding part. And uh, yeah, and also, yeah, thank you for, uh, thank you for this opportunity to, uh, thank, you for, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Like this is a great learning experience for me. And thanks to all the participants who are listening to the talk now. Thank you very much. So in this, with this, I will end the talk. Yeah. Are there any questions for uh, Hari? Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Are there any questions for Hari? Yeah, oh, okay.
Okay, I had a question. Yeah. When you increase the number of training samples, right? Like, can you show that monotonically the accuracy increases? Is that? Yeah, see, actually, you know, uh, yeah. See, Do we uh, plateau? No, it, it actually, in many, several cases, we can see a saturation. It must, uh, it, yeah, the monotonical increase is not always always true in our case, at least in the, in the case of neurochaos learning. It, it gets saturated. So that can be seen also as a limitation of the algorithm. Like, the algorithm can, maybe it gets saturated. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is like, we should think of this as some sort of, uh, this is like some sort of a one-shot learning, right? Yeah, yeah, you can, uh, yes, correct. So uh, what is interesting is like, I was wondering if there is, uh, uh, maybe I should go back and look at your paper some more. So sure. there isn't back propagation. And uh, if you fix Q and B, and you're just changing epsilon, that yeah. the trajectories are, uh, Kind of known. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if it's uh, is it like a uh, is the structure the same across classification problems when you do different classification pro problems? What kind of epsilons are you getting? Yeah, so epsilons are different. Yeah, epsilons are different. It, it depends on the problem. It depends on the classification task. Like it depends on the data set basically. See, the, uh, let, I'll just take a simple example. Like like let's if the data samples are very cross, right? Okay. okay. If, if the data samples are very close, if the data instances are, let's say uh, if all the data instances are very, very close to each other, right? So for that particular case, a different epsilon has to work, right? Like it cannot, uh, that epsilon will be different from a data instance where, where all the, all the, uh, all the values of the data are, uh, are very, uh, very highly, uh, are highly, there's high variance in the data, sam data inst uh, instances itself. So in both the cases, epsilons are different. There is no unique epsilon for uh, for for every problem it's, it's different yeah okay but uh, uh, but it's not like uh, say the uh, it's not a function of the number of classes or anything uh, it's like no a, we couldn't find such a such a such a, such a like yeah yeah such a connection we couldn't find like that uh, like a function of a it, number it, of classes it depends on how the input distribution itself is uh huh. Ah, yeah. yeah I think. Good. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the way I thought about it is like, see, our brains work the same way, right? Whether you are throwing cats and dogs at me or like zeros and ones at me, we are. Are we processing the same way or probably not? You don't think there is a way to? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that question? No, what I mean to say is like our brains are also classifying it in a certain way, right? Like we. Um, uh, how do you want to, I mean, I can do a cat and dog classification. I can do zero, one to nine classification. I mean, I'm yes. also doing the same thing in my head, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm wondering if it is like just, is there a, a, a way to think of it like that? Like uh, it's... Yeah, because there's something called neural code, right? So okay. so we are extracting, so the, the neural code for uh, like uh, realizing and uh, recognizing something for as a cat is different from neural code for uh, recognizing something as something as a human right so in the same way we have something called like like firing rate similar to that so that for a, for recognizing a cat is different from that of a that of a human yeah, yeah just to add to what hari said uh, naveen yeah so actually what you said is very true see uh, the whole idea of continual learning is the same thing right like in our thing we don't, let's say you are doing a two class classification. Okay. And then you want to do a three class classification. We don't need to relearn the representation vectors. Exactly. What you already learned will stay put, you know, they will not exactly. change. So exactly. it is very much like how the brain is, I mean, I mean, at least in, in a loose sense. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thanks for that. I, I understand. I think this is interesting work. No question. Uh, we, I'm, it's just so different from what we are used to. So I was just trying to process it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a very interesting talk. We will uh, get back to you if we have some questions. Sure. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank, you. yeah. Thank you for making the time, Hari. Thank you for the time, Nitin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye.